Between Two Fires, Chapter 6. Of the marriage on the bank and the visitation in the stable. The woman stumbled down the muddy road, trying to remember how to get to the river. She had lived in Saint-Martin-de-Preux her whole life, but the fever made her forgetful and she kept losing her way. The hail had woken her up from what might have been her last sleep, and when she woke she had such a thirst that only the river could slake it. Besides, a devil was in her house. Not the devil himself, but a small one. A goat kid with a twitching tail that climbed on the bed with her and tried to steal her breath when she got sleepy. It leapt away when she woke and hid in the shadows, waiting for her to get sleepy again. She would cheat it this time. She knew it wouldn't follow her to the river. She went out into the hail and took a beating from it, but it stopped soon and turned to cold, stinging rain. She got terribly lost, even though she knew the river was close, and she slapped her palm on several doors, some of them doors she recognized as belonging to friends, but nobody opened to her. She cried against the wall at one house, and a gentle voice from inside, her sister's voice, said, Go on now, Mathilde. I, have, I still have the two children. You mustn't give it to them. Go on. So on she went. Her children had died of it, and her sweet old husband, and his brother, and she was the last one in the house. She had paid a young boy to care for her when she knew she had it, but he had left after one day. All he did was bring her things she asked for, but he refused to empty her slop jar, and still he wanted a week's farm wages from the first day. She paid him, but he saw where she got the money from and took the coffer in the night, leaving her with nothing. The boy had worked with her husband, learning to be a cobbler. Now he had his master's money, but little good it would do him in hell. He was already sweating with the first fevers. It was after he left that the little goat had come. The woman had no wimple on, and her pale orange hair hung greasily about her shoulders. Her eyes were red and swollen. Windows closed as she passed them, and it began to make her angry. She wanted to stop and have words with the betrayers who were abandoning her, but her throat hurt like it had pins in it, and if it came to a fray, she didn't want anyone touching her left armpit, which had grown a painful swelling the size of a crab apple that gurgled at night and seemed to speak to her. She had to get to the river. At length, she remembered a turn between two houses that she had passed several times, and she stumbled downhill, laughing and crying at the same time at the sight of the water. She didn't care if the water was clean as long as it was cold. She would wade into it and might even put her head under to stop the heat in it. That was when she saw the knight lying on his stomach with his feet in the river. She knelt next to him and drank, coughing half of it back up. Something foul was in it, foul and oily, but her throat felt better. She looked at the knight and saw that he was strong and beautiful and dead. She cried for how beautiful he was. Even his scars were beautiful and perfect. The pit on his cheek where God had put his finger to mark him as holy. She lay down next to him on her side and took off his helmet. He still wore a chain mail hood, but she could see his hard, beautiful face better now. Her husband's wedding ring was on a cord around her neck and she took this off and breathed on it and pushed it onto the knight's finger, though it wouldn't pass the second knuckle, because his were soldiers' hands. I marry you, she said. I marry you now, knight. She cried and kissed his still mouth, tenderly at first, then with her tongue. His mouth was warm. He was breathing. She became confused about whether he was dead. 
Perhaps not, but like her, he would be soon. Everyone would be soon. She used her hair to clean his brow, and she stroked his face with her hand. My husband is in heaven with his first wife, but I will go to heaven too, and you will be my husband there, and I will be a good wife. I will show you. I will dress for bed, she said and took off her sickness-stained gown and one of her muddy hose. She got tired unrolling the second one and draped herself across the knight's armored back and died there. And that was how the priest found the armored man and the pale dead woman nude but for one stocking, her back covered in plague tokens the color of eggplant, as if a little goat had danced upon her and bruised her with its hooves. Where am I? Tomas shouted from the bed, his eyes wild. You're in my home, the priest said, looking down at him. You've been hurt. The priest was holding a lantern near his nose and mouth. It was night. Tomas began to remember. The creatures in his dream had not been friendly, so he took a moment trying to remember if this priest was. Frogs. Now he remembered. Frogs had come, latching onto him, covering his face and hands. He had been watching from outside himself as spiny little frogs ate him. He shuddered, then kept shuddering. The pains in his head and in the corner of his groin were distinct. One was leaden and dull, like an old rusty lock set at the top of his neck and embraced his temples. The other was hot, like someone had taken a coal from a brazier and tucked it at the top of his pubis. Everything on him felt clammy and sticky. He sneezed. He looked up at the priest again and saw the half of his face that was brightly lit by the lantern he held close to it. Three superficial scratches jagged across the priest's cheek. <sighs> What have you done with her? Tomas said and sat up heavily, looking at the priest with dangerous, murky eyes. Nothing, friend. She's... Oh, the scratches. She gave me those when I pulled her away from you. On the shore. Really, I was pulling her away from the... There was a young wife, Matilda. A good woman. With Christ now, if any of us will be. You may be sick. Where is the girl? I persuaded her to sleep in the stables tonight, but she will come back when she wakes up. She sat on that little stool near you until an hour ago. She's quite faithful. Tomas looked under the threadbare sheet that covered him and saw what the thing in the river had done to him. An awful hole a few inches above the base of his verge wept into the hair there. All the skin around it was swollen, and a separate swelling was coming in near it where the leg met the groin. The whole area was a misery. So I have some uncleanness in me from that thing, as well as the plague. It seems so. Did you give me last rites? Three hours ago. I'll try not to sin. You're in no condition to sin, except perhaps unclean thoughts. Not having any. Hurts too much down there. You're safe from lust, at least, having any temptations about gluttony. Tomas shook his head. And it's hardly sloth for a sick man to rest. Don't worry. I'll look after your soul. As for the body, that's in God's hands. Tomas nodded. You killed it, you know. Tomas made a pleased sound, and his lids got heavy. It floated downriver like an old empty sock, leaving its awful guts behind it. It was an awful, murderous thing, and you killed it with your own hand. It was worthy of a saint. Tomas slept.
He woke up again just before dawn to the sound of labored breathing, not his own. Someone was suffering, trying to breathe with pierced lungs. He hadn't heard that sound since the catastrophe at Crecy, when he lay with a broken leg and an arrow through his face, listening to his seigneur breathe his last breaths, sucking bloody air in around the ashwood arrows that had punched through his chain hauberk in three places. He always loved his lord for not moaning as other men did, as Tomas did. He knew in his heart that his lord, the Comte de Givras, had died awake, gritting his teeth, using the last of his strength to keep from making an unchivalrous noise. The Comte was not as strong in the arms as Tomas, almost nobody was, but he was tougher. He died a better death than Tomas was about to, fouling his sick sheets in bed. But now that horrible breathing. Outside his window, a shadow passed. He got to his feet and found that the right leg was completely numb, as if it had fallen asleep, and it was all he could do not to crash to the floor. He was sick and dizzy, and his nose was running into his beard but he got his sword and moved past the sleeping priest. He opened the door in time to see the form of a man limping toward the stables where the girl was. You, he said, but <coughs> coughed at the end of it. The figure didn't turn. Tomas tried to run at it, but now his woodish leg betrayed him and tumbled onto the ground where he blacked out. He came to not very long after, and went farther toward the stables where he saw the girl and the figure talking over a lantern. His eyes were tearing, and he couldn't see well, but it looked like a man, a shirtless man with long spines. Tomas lurched toward the couple, but the world spun again, and he went out. Excuse me for a moment. He woke again moments later, or thought he did, to find the spined man helping him into bed, except the man was bleeding all over the bed and laboring to breathe because he was full of arrows, not spines. Seigneur, Tomas tried to say, but it wasn't his lord. He didn't recognize the man, a short, dark-haired youth with protuberant, drilling eyes that looked almost luminous. The man exhaled a shuddering breath, spraying a small amount of froth from his chest wounds, then pressed hard with his thumb on Tomas's forehead, forcing him to fully recline. It hurt. The man wheezed and coughed horribly and limped out of the room. Tomas still felt the imprint of that hard thumb. He slept, but not before he muttered, Sebastian, St. Sebastian, help me. Chapter 7 Of the Battle of Song of Angels In the morning, the girl told the priest that the three of them were going to the shrine of the Virgin of the White Rock, Ten miles north, she was granting miracles to some, the virgin, and she would rid Tomas of the plague. But child, the priest said, this man cannot travel. And the bishop heard rumors of this shrine many years ago and visited it and declared that while it was a holy place and Christians should pray there, they should expect no miracles. A saint had told her. She bit her lip wondering if she should let them know one spoke to her. It seemed better to keep that secret. A higher power than the bishop says the shrine is healing people, and we can take the knight upon a cart. If I had a cart, go to the almond orchard and pray. 
God will show you a way, she said. No, the priest said forcefully. We must stay here. If God wants our friend to live, he will bestow that grace upon him wherever he is. Her insides fluttered as though a small bird were near her heart. Words came to her. She closed her eyes and said them. Matthew Heinicott, she said, calling the priest by his true name, which he had never told her. You say these words because you fear to leave your little home. But I turn your words upon you. If death means to take you, he may do it here as easily as on the road. He is already in this house. A chill passed through the priest, and he said meekly, Watch over our friend. I am going to the orchard. The dead man's cart was in good repair, and the three of them were soon upon the road to Rochelle la Blanche, a hill village where granite was quarried. The priest drove the fine cart while Tomas lay feverish in the back of it. The girl held a cross over him with one hand and lay her other upon his burning chest. The priest was certain she was a saint. He had no other way to explain his discovery in the orchard. The cart's owner had broken his neck trying to stand on the wheel of the cart and beat the last almonds from a high branch. The body was still warm when the priest found him. A chill had gone through Mathieu Anicot, and for a moment he wondered if the girl was diabolic in nature. He thought not. Then he had a moment to wonder whether God had slain this man to provide them a cart, or if he had merely directed Mathieu to the scene of this sad event already foreordained. What was the difference? Everything served God's will, and here, at last, after months of senseless deaths and unending tears, was a tragedy that bore some fruit. The priest had blessed this man, then cried and thanked God for at last revealing his face to him. For all those thanks, however, the mule was, <laughs> the mule was stubborn. Oh dear, forgive me. For all those thanks, however, the mule was stubborn, and it had taken the priest nearly half an hour to get moving, but now the mule was happy to pull. As they got closer, they passed others bearing the sick and dying to Rochelle la Blanche. It was midday when they saw the town, and the mob that was heading there. Please forgive me, excuse me one second. It looks like people are trying to get in touch with me. No, it looks all right. Nearly 30 peasants, mostly men, were marching on the town, several of them pulling a small empty cart by hand. They were all armed. When they noticed the priest's cart coming up behind them, they turned. A mule, one shouted. Get the mule, said a woman with a two-pronged wooden pitchfork. It's a priest, another said. Fuck him, we have a priest too. And we need that mule, said a man in gaudy yellow stockings. Père Mathieu felt a shock of ice in his heart, and he nearly froze with fear. The night could have made the mob think twice, but he was dying. Then an idea came to Mathieu, and he leapt to his feet, standing tall in the cart, and though his knees shook, he kept his voice firm. He who wants the plague, come and take this mule, for plague is upon this man you see here. He who wants his soul in hell, come and take this mule unlawfully from one of God's priests and stop us on our pilgrimage. This halted their frightening surge toward the cart. Now the woman with a wooden fork said, Come with us, father. Help us take the virgin back. What? said the priest. He now noticed a stocky, cow-eyed priest among the farmers. That priest was holding a pewter candlestick like a club and seemed abashed to have encountered another of his sort. 
He shook this off and spoke. Yes, brother. We're taking our virgin back. She was stolen from our village, Chanson des Anges, by those bastards of Rochelle la Blanche during the great hunger of seventeen. Since then, God has smiled upon them and pissed upon us for not defending her. Help us in our rightful suit. Shame on you, brother, Père Mathieu said. The girl stood now, wide-eyed, and said, You've got devils with you, right now, with you. In your hearts, Père Mathieu said quickly, suddenly scared this mob might decide she was a witch. For the devil is in any heart that moves a man to hurt his neighbor, yet he will leave you in peace if you will put your weapons down and turn from your sin. This is your last chance. You're not from here, the club-wielding priest said viciously and suddenly, as if the words weren't his, and began toward the cart. The girl's gaze stopped him. I see it, she said quietly. I know what's at your elbow. It was the cutting of a marionette. The stocky priest began to cry then, blubbering incoherently. The woman with the fork came now and grabbed him by the shoulder. To hell with them, she said. Let's get our lady back. Chanson des anges, she said. The crowd echoed her cry, and they lurched toward the village, pulling the weeping priest with them. Even though it took place at Rochelle la Blanche, the battle would henceforth be known as the Battle of Chanson des Anges, because the attackers shouted that again and again. They shouted it as they waded into and pushed aside the crowd of sick and penitent pilgrims that surrounded the statue. They shouted it as they broke the arm of the priest of Rochelle la Blanche, who threw himself in front of his blessed lady to defend her. They shouted it as they broke the pretty white stone statue from its nook in the white rock beside the church, leaving a piece of her foot. They shouted it at the group of men who began to form in the market square nearby, now six, now a dozen, shouting and pointing and summoning others. Then one in the chanson mob said, Do not let them gather! Nobody was sure who said it, because only the girl could see the foul thing that spoke those words. A stone flew, then a brick. Someone shot an arrow. Then the invading mob rushed at the outnumbered men in the square, and a horrible melee began. The Rochelle townsmen scattered, but more were coming. The Virgin must have been working true miracles here. More healthy men were gathered, or more healthy men were gathering than the priest or the girl had seen in one place since the sickness first came. Now a hunchback in a blacksmith's apron ran toward the Rochelle men dragging a box from which they began to pull swords, axes, and hammers. Defend the lady, someone said, and the Chanson des Anges mob fell back toward their cart, where the Virgin of the White Rock lay awkwardly on her side, and they formed a ring about it. The men of Rochelle surrounded them. They were reluctant to start killing, but then someone in the square held up the body of a little blonde boy, whose head had been busted by a brick. Perrin, one screamed. They killed little Perrin. The twenty or so defending the cart screamed defiantly, Chanson des anges! Chanson des anges! As if daring the thirty well-armed farmers, tradesmen, and granite workers to slaughter them. They took the dare. The two groups bludgeoned, stabbed, cut, and gouged each other while dust flew and screams rang out. When at last the people of Chanson were nearly overcome, the woman with a fork dropped it and picked up a fallen hammer, jumping up into the cart with the virgin. If we won't have her, you won't either. Fuck her, she said, and smashed the virgin's arm from her body. Back in Père Mathieu's cart, the girl screamed. The fighting stopped, and everyone watched, stunned. Fuck her! Fuck her! The woman screamed, wide-eyed. The hammer fell again and again, and the virgin's nose was busted. 
Two more strokes, and the statue, once so beautiful that men wept to see her, was nothing but rocks. White dust covered the chanson woman's face. Something laughed, but only the girl saw what. Death! screamed a Rochelle man, and death answered his summons. None from the chanson des anges was left alive. The last one, the cow-eyed priest, was killed with the same brick that killed the little boy Perrin. Afterward, the survivors took the wounded off and the people of Rochelle Blanche cleared as far away from the killing field as they could. The girl tore herself away from Père Mathieu and walked through the twisted bodies toward the ruin of the Virgin of the White Rock. She was shaking and weeping, looking far smaller and younger than she had. She bent near the cart and picked up the statue's arm, hugging it to her. The priest helped her up into his cart now, where Tomas lay very still, breathing his last. Tomas had the impression that something with a cold, fishy mouth was tugging at him. His bladder loosed and he breathed out, his chest rattling. He did not inhale. The girl took the virgin's hand and forearm up and pressed the two stone fingers held out in benediction against the knight's forehead, just where he had felt St. Sebastian's thumb the night before. She pressed hard. The thing with the fishy mouth left. Tomas gasped and opened his eyes. And then he slept. Tomas woke up and thought something was horribly wrong, a dream in which his mother wove at her loom and sung a chanson de toile about a common woman who loved a great seigneur, dissolved. Now an angel was rubbing his head with a cool cloth. He had died, he was sure of that, but under no circumstances should he be in heaven. He turned his eyes to look at the angel and saw that it was only the girl, her very grey eyes were on him, waiting to see if he would speak. I died, he said. Almost. You saved me? God did. With the hand of the Virgin, it was her last miracle. Tomas coughed, but less horribly than he had before the end. Um, I stink, he said. The priest, who was near the hearth, said, Not like you did. What's stinking now is just the bed straw. Some of your sickness went into that, I think. One thing you never get used to is the way the sick ones smell. As if we needed any further proof, this curse fell from the heavens to show us how corrupt we are. He went back to stirring the pot on the fire. What's there to eat? Tomas said. Oh, he has an appetite. There's a hopeful sign. Of course, having received last rites and lived, you're supposed to fast perpetually now and go barefoot and remain chaste. Tomas grunted. Oh. But I won't tell anyone if you won't. What's to eat, he says. Nothing but the worst soup in Christendom. Grasses, flowers, twigs, some fungus from the sides of trees, a blighted radish, and, ooh, best of all, four baby birds I broke free from their eggs. I was hoping just to get yolks and whites, but the chicks were nearly ready to enter this sad world. Now they're in soup. You'll have to eat one, bones and all. I've had worse. Well, I haven't. I'm just a soft priest in a cozy village, or I was. At least there's a little salt. I spared a pinch of salt so we could choke the rest down. The girl changed the water into Moss's cloth and rubbed his temples again. It was so cool and so good. He closed his eyes and breathed a long, contented sigh. This was the best he had felt since... since something awful happened. What? Something in a river. What I can't stop thinking about, the priest went on, is wine. I never thought it would just run out. 
I thought men would always make wine, as bees make honey and cows make milk. That I should one day find nobody, not one person, with a skin or cask or pitcher of wine to sell, had never occurred to me. I pray for you, Père Mathieu, the girl said, that I'll find good wine. That God will fill you so full with his love that you will not need wine. That's a fine prayer, girl, but if it's no trouble, ask the Lord to send me a little wine along with his love. I promise to be grateful for both. Tomas got better slowly, but more quickly than any of those few the priest had seen survive the plague. He took walks in the priest's yard, slurped bad soup, cracked the few stray almonds left in the cart, and savored the last of the girl's honey. By the end of August, she was asking if he felt well enough to travel. Let me guess. Paris, then Avignon. Yes. For mysterious reasons that will come to you later. Yes. It must have to do with the Pope. I don't know. Because the Pope lives there. And you lived in Picardy. Was everyone who came to Picardy coming to see you? A priest. Is this little girl a witch or a saint? A saint, I think, Père Mathieu said. But you're not sure? No, actually, I'm not. Would you like to go to Paris with us? No. So you'll stay here, then? No. Which is it? I'll go to Paris. You asked me if I would like to go to Paris. I would not. But I'm out of food, wine, and parishioners, so, like it or not, I have to leave my pleasant little house. If she's a saint, this is a holy pilgrimage. If she's a witch, I might try to mitigate her wickedness. They left on the first day of September. On the third of September, against the wishes of his wife, the seigneur of saint martin le preux at last gave in to the yapping of his herald and seneschal, who claimed the priest was harboring a coarse man who had insulted the Lord's honor and broken his bell, as well as having provoked the foulness in the river to kill numerous peasants, on one of whom it seemed to have choked and burst itself. The Lord reluctantly sent his last three men-at-arms down to search the priest's house, but they found that the priest had left. Knowing the priest's brother to be a servant in the house of his holiness in Avignon, the men searched the house for treasures Père Mathieu might have left behind. One of them poked in the dirt of the yard with his polearm. One went through his trunk, his pot, and his few tools. The other turned up the straw of the bed. The next day, this man had a fever. Four days later, Everyone in the castle was dead. The new seneschal was last, crying at his own image in a polished piece of brass, trying with a shaking hand to paint fine eyebrows on the ruin he had become. Chapter 8 Of the Feast and of the Night Tourney The castle was deceptive in its proximity. It floated on its pale green hill for the last half of the day, seeming as distant as a celestial body, and then, at dusk, it was upon them with its proud white walls and turrets. The banners of the seigneur flew from the square keep, and men walked at ease atop the gatehouse, where the drawbridge was down and welcome. Perhaps the plague had spared this place. Let's stop here and see if we can get a meal, Tomas said. I have to get to Paris, said the girl. And still you won't say why. I don't know yet. I counter what you don't know with what I do know. We are hungry, and being fed is better than being hungry. Not always, she said. Yes, always, said Tomas. The priest said, I don't see what's wrong with fortifying ourselves. If they will share with us, 
I have a little coin. The girl shook her head obstinately, but Tomas stopped the cart and looked for a long while at the strong castle, imagining where an attacker would place siege engines and try to dig tunnels if he came up against this toothy stone beast. The hill was steep, the ground was tough-boned, and the walls were well built and hung with wooden hoardings from which defenders could work all sorts of evil against attackers. The English would have the devil's own time trying to get in there if they came. Let's go, the little girl whined, sounding less like a witch or a saint and more like a brat who needed the back of the hand. Shut up, Tomas said. A rider's coming. Just as the sun went down, a man on a delicate-looking Arab horse issued from the open gate, pluming dust behind him. The priest smoothed his robes and held up his crozier. The girl knitted her brow. Tomas, seeing the splendid livery of the herald shining even in the failing light, suddenly remembered that he was in a cart and felt ashamed. Carts were for peasants, not men-at-arms. He got out of it and stood, holding his hand up in salute. The herald of this castle was every bit as sunny and pleasant as the one in saint martin de preux had been haughty and contemptuous. His voice broke out of him like birds from a copse of trees. Greetings to you, friends in God's love. Are you come to see the tourney, or, he said, looking at Tomas, to compete in it? Neither, friend, said Tomas. We are on our way to Paris. Paris? Have you heard no news from there? No. Perhaps because nobody is coming out alive. The scourge is carrying off three hundred a day there. Death reigns in that city, and there is no law, and there is no food. There is little food anywhere. Our tables are well kept. And the plague? It has come and gone. We were touched, and then it sputtered and went out. Our seigneur has ordered us to be merry and gay, and to fear no strangers, and to make music. He has ordered fife, drum, and viol players to play at every hour, even through the night. He believes the sickness, like a dog, bites those who fear it. The dog I saw bites everyone and can't hear music. I can only speak for what has happened here, my lord. Many fell, but now none fall, and jolly music plays all the time. I am no lord. A pity you might have broken a lance tonight, in the night tourney. I thought tournaments were forbidden by the king. The king's arm has grown short. Tomas smiled, showing his white teeth. I would like to see this tourney. He said, Can you ride? I have no horse, but can you ride? Well enough. We might find one for you. You look like a man who has spun a quintain or two, and if the truth be told, we are not so well provisioned with knights that we will turn our noses up at any worthy horseman. Our lord has called for a tourney, and we shall make one as best we can. Will you fight? No, the girl said, and Tomas shot her a cold look. Yes, he said. Excellent. In that case, I shall have the privilege of inviting you to my lord's table this evening. Are you hungry? God, yes, the priest said. The girl would not go to the castle. Tomas commanded, the priest entreated, and in the end she skittered up a tree. For Christ's sake, Tomas said, get down from there. Nothing. We've been eating twigs and earwax for a week. Now we have the chance to really fill, fill our bellies, and you do this. Nothing. Stop being headstrong and get in that car. It's getting dark. God damn it. Don't make me leave you out here. And don't think I won't. Nothing. Suit yourself, Tomas said, and turned to follow the herald, who was politely waiting just out of earshot. The priest sat in the cart alone, torn between the two of them. Go with him, Père Mathieu, she said from her perch. 
he could only see her feet. But I'll be safe here. It's not safe. I'll be all right. I know how to sleep in a tree without falling out. Go. You want to. Yes. He needs you, she said, and disappeared farther up into the tree. The priest nodded and drove the cart behind the herald's horse, upon which Tomas was now also mounted. The pale grass of the hillside was punctuated with thistles of the brightest purple, each flower of which seemed to have been issued exactly one bumblebee. Simon will show you to your chambers, the herald said, indicating a sullen but brightly liveried boy who met them once they were inside the portcullis. What is the name of this place? Tomas said. The herald smiled pleasantly, as if this were a joke. Supper will be in an hour. The serving boy had spoken very little, but had ushered them to a small but cosy room with a real bed in it. The most he said to them at once was, The sire invites you to go wherever you wish before supper. Tomas, who had been grinning broadly ever since they slipped between the strong walls of the castle, nevertheless decided to strip his armor, stay in his chambers, and close his eyes so he might be fresh for the meal. The priest went off to explore. Two men came and asked for Tomas's armor. The herald said you might want this cleaned. Tomas hesitated while the wary man he had been since Crecy struggled with the man he was before. The earlier man won out. Tomas handed over his gear and was given a handsome green robe with cloth of gold stars to wear for dinner. He hung it from a nail and lay down to sleep in his stinking long shirt. The priest crawled into bed beside Tomas an hour later. What did you think? A magnificent fortress, really, the tapestries. In the old style, but such colors, and such a mighty tower. I went atop the battlements and felt that, had it been daytime, I might have seen all the way to Avignon and beyond. I tell you, I think I'll see the Afric shore tomorrow. You lie, priest. I embellish. But the height was astonishing. In the morning, I'll have to get the boy to take me to the chapel. I would have thought you'd go there first. I tried. I got confused in all the halls and couldn't find it. The boy showed up just before the feast and shook them both awake from where they snored on the bed. They followed him to the great hall, which rang with the sounds of music and cheerful speech as they approached. Tomas felt ten years younger than he was, up on the balls of his feet with anticipation. The tangy, earthy smells of cooked meat and pastries brought water to their mouths as they rounded the archway and saw the hall. Thank you, my God, my merciful God, that the world is still sane and happy here at least whispered the priest as he caught sight of wine going from a jar with a mouth like a lion into a lady's goblet. The herald strode over to them and embraced Tomas before announcing them both. Sire, I present Sir Tomas of Picardy and Père Mathieu of Saint-Martin-le-Preux. Sir Tomas has agreed to try his skill at arms tonight for our amusement and his greater glory. The lord of the castle, a stunted but ferocious leonine man with little black eyes, looked up from his conversation with a Germanic-looking knight and grinned a black-toothed grin at Tomas and the priest. A plump, black-haired young woman with a high forehead sat next to him, seeming half asleep and indifferent to everything. Any man who has hardened himself with the practice of arms is welcome here. Next, any woman at all. After that, certain musicians and priests, he said, following his jest with a roar of laughter Aha! that others around him quickly mimicked. You are the fourth man. Now we can have our little sport tomorrow. I hear you ride a mule. Tomas bristled at that, but said quietly, My horse has died. That wouldn't stop a proper horse. Well, then, 
you shall have one of mine. Have you an armorer? I have only my armor, my sword, and this priest. You could use my armorer and my priest if you like. Yours looks like a bugger. Is there a priest who isn't? asked the German-looking fellow, who turned out to be a Frenchman. The whole table laughed, as well as the hurdy-gurdy player, who had stopped turning his handle while the Lord spoke. Did I tell you to stop playing? Your job is to keep the plague out, not stand there and laugh at our jokes like they're meant for you to hear. Turn that goddamn thing and make it pretty, or I'll break your hands. Is there anything sadder than a hurdy-gurdy player with broken hands? Maybe a Jew who sneezes at the sight of gold. Everyone laughed, except Tomas and the priest. The Lord noted this and said, How dull! Pointed at them and flicked his hand. Little Simon sat them at one end of the... Uh, he sat them at one of the far arms of the great U-shaped table. The hurdy-gurdy played loudly and conversation resumed. Kitchen women brought a basin around from person to person so hands might be washed. And then the herald announced, Sir Théobald de Barentin and his squire François. Simon placed them at the other arm of the U, across from Tomas and the priest. This Théobald looked familiar. He was a little younger than Tomas, with sandy hair, a small patch of beard on his chin, and clever bug eyes made for mockery. The squire was a dandy. Theobald saw Tomas looking at him, wink quickly, then whispered something to the squire. The squire snickered. Tomas's hand dropped to where his sword hung on its belt. He just rested it on the pommel. This gesture was not lost on Theobald, however, who winked again. Even more provocatively than the first time, Tomas grinned at him, suddenly boyishly happy at the probability that he would be swinging a weapon at this man in the coming hours. The food was beyond belief in its variety and in the skill of its presentation. The first course to appear was announced by the herald as Cathar Delight. Pastries in the form of a small tower were shared out until a breach formed that revealed, within the tower, a painted almond paste statue of a nude woman tied to a stake amid flames of crystallized honey and ginger that were to be broken off and sucked. The woman was crudely made, her chest flat, recognizable as a woman only by her vivid golden hair. I'll have you all know, my great-grandfather was a famous killer of heretics, the seigneur boasted, but he might have spared this one. The flames were all gone, so he lifted the woman out and licked her sticky belly shamelessly, then bit off her legs. Fruits and cheeses came next, served in bowls painted with images of men and women copulating the priest ate hungrily from them, and when Tomas pointed out the figures, the priest shrugged and said, Perhaps this is as close as I get to being fruitful and multiplying. Tomas kept looking at him, amused by his moral flexibility. At least the sinful painter was a man of talent, wouldn't you agree? He said, and Tomas laughed. I wonder how the girl's getting on, the priest said now. As well as she deserves, Tomas said. I will not be governed by her in every little thing. If she wants me to go to Paris, fine, but she'll learn to stay where I say and eat where I say. Eating from these bowls may not be a sin, but I should have stayed with her, the priest said. What, up her tree? I could have sat beneath it. You still can. Nobody's keeping you here. Yes, the priest said, then looked up at where the hurdy-gurdy player had come very near staring at him while he played loudly and smiled. A woman filled the priest's goblet with thick red wine. Père Mathieu did not leave. Now vases and amphorae heaped with roasted eels and lampreys were brought to table, but Tomas thought of the thing in the river and could not bring himself to try these. 
he did notice Theobald of Berentin greedily heaping eels upon his platter. When he saw he had Tomas's eye, he bit into one of the long fish and said, Vengeance at last! and laughed, though Tomas had no idea what he meant. The main course came next. Three kings, the herald intoned. And women brought out a huge platter piled with venison and other exotic meats, and several boats of garlicky brown gravy. Peacock and pheasant feathers accented it artfully, and topping it were three large roasted monkeys sitting on cedar thrones wearing capes of ermine. They wore golden crowns, which the cook, a man with narrow eyes and very long fingers, proudly tipped back, letting steam rise from their open skulls, into which he placed three elegant spoons. The chamber burst into applause, and one fleshy woman actually wept, though whether for the beauty of the display or the pathos of the monkeys was unclear. The seigneur practically leapt from his chair. He took the spoon from the central monkey's head and slurped the delicate meat, contorting his face in ecstasy. Priest, he said, how do you say, this is my brain? The priest looked flabbergasted. Well, uh, in Latin? No, in cunting Flemish. Latin, Latin! What else do you ask a bugger priest about? Well, hoc est cerebrum meum, but that's uncomfortably close to... A monkey may speak Latin, may he not? If a monkey may speak at all, I suppose. The Lord slurped again from the spoon, then said, Hoc est cerebrum meum, in the squeakiest monkey voice he could muster. Now he dipped the spoon back into the monkey's head and walked a spoonful of brain purposefully over to the priest's lips. Say it, he commanded. My lord, oh, excuse me, my lord, Tomas said evenly, but with a steady gaze, I, I, forgive me, but no. My lord, Tomas said, scooting his chair back a little across the hall, Theobald de Barentin scooted his chair back as well. The hall was silent now. The seigneur shot Tomas a look that made him suddenly see a lion killing an old man on sand with a hooting crowd looking on. The image left as quickly as it came. Very well, the seigneur said in a mildly conciliatory tone. The priest need not speak Latin for us, but he shall have no brains until he does and no wine until he has brains. So saying, he turned his back and walked the spoon back toward the three kings. The priest cleared his throat. <clears> Hoc. <throat> Hoc est cerebrum meum, he said quietly. The Lord turned on his heel now, grinning mildly, and steered the spoon for the priest's mouth, which he opened accepting the spoonful of salty, garlic-scented meat. It was the best thing he ever tasted. His goblet was filled. At just that moment, the seigneur noticed that the hurdy-gurdy player had stopped playing to watch the standoff. He grabbed the little man's closest arm, dragged him to the table, and in three nauseating blows, broke his hand against it with a heavy pewter mug. The musician screamed and ran off, dropping his hurdy-gurdy, which broke as well. Where's the veal player? Sleeping, sire, the herald said. He played all last night for us. Wake him. Tomas and the priest ate to bursting. Tomas ate no monkey, but he did fill his trencher with cuts of strange meat. He drenched well in the intoxicating gravy. What is this? he asked a serving woman. <coughs> Deer, ram, wild boar, she said. It is all roasted together. Tastes boarish, but strange bones for a boar, Tomas said. Perhaps I am mistaken. My lord has beasts from many lands in his cages, and they are eaten when it pleases him. 
or perhaps it is a Jew. The man next to Tomas laughed so hard at this he nearly choked. The viol player, while pale with exhaustion, was very skilled. He looked Moorish and moved his hips in strange and sensual rolls while he drew across the honey-sweet strings. Tomas was becoming drunk, and the priest was drunker. He noticed Père Mathieu watching the musician distractedly. Jesus Christ, you are a bugger, Tomas laughed but there was no laughter in his eyes. No, just the music. I am enraptured with it. I, I have never heard its equal, the priest said. A fat drop of sweat fell from his nose, or almost never. Tomas noticed the bored gaze of the woman who sat beside the seigneur upon him now. The fire from the hearth and many torches made her headpiece twinkle hypnotically. She was beautiful more so than he had noticed before. He raised his goblet slightly in salute to her, which she answered by dipping her thumb into a monkey's head and putting that thumb into her mouth. Tomas saw her tongue flicker for just a moment and knew that the wound he got at saint martin de preux was completely healed. I think the Lord's daughter likes you, said the man next to Tomas. Daughter? She's past a maiden's age. Where is her husband? She is newly widowed. How newly? He was killed at Crecy. That was two years ago. Are you quite sure? I was there. Oh, well, seems like yesterday. She was quite attached to him. We all were. What was the knight's name? You know, I have forgotten. I'll just ask her. Euphemie! Oh! The man turned, or the woman turned her head slowly and looked at the man. Her eyes were very large and very green. What do you want, Hubert? What was your husband's name? My husband? Yes, you know, the very tall, handsome one who gave you several stillbirths and then went off to die in Picardy. Ah, him. His name was... Horace? barked her father. No. It was Pierrot, suggested the viol player with a decidedly Aragonese inflection, never missing a stroke on his instrument or a turn of his waspish hips. No, you silly hedgecock, I would never spread my legs for anyone named Pierrot. No, it was. She opened her mouth now and issued a deep manly belch. One heartbeat after it was finished, the whole room erupted in exuberant laughter. Tomas was sloshily offended. He banged his fist on the table. Nobody noticed. So he banged his wooden goblet on the table, splashing wine all over himself and the priest. The laughter died off to a trickle. You go too far, he shouted at his fellow celebrants. You injure the memory of a worthy man. He was swaying. Oh, said the seigneur, amused and intrigued. How so? The, the wine-sotted soldier could not answer and almost cried, remembering his lord's hard death. The man next to Tomas said, Please forgive him, sire. He was also at the cursed defeat of Crecy, and I think his heart was broken there. Perhaps he knew the man in question, Sir Knight he said, turning to face Tomas. While you were serving under our noble king, did you have the honor of knowing a tall, handsome chevalier named Burp? Everyone laughed. Tomas went to backhand the man, but fell, causing the room to laugh harder. He got to his feet, feeling nauseated. I will not dine with you, troop of pigs he said, and looked around for the priest, who was passed out now with his head on his arm and a puddle of drool under his face. He jerked at the priest's robe, but the priest did not awaken. Tomas left him where he was and lurched in the general direction of the door, followed by the viol player who used his music to dramatize Tomas's struggle to make an indignant exit. The room was hysterical. A woman gasped for breath near him. Oh, God! Oh, God! I think I pissed myself. He kicked 
backward at the the old player, catching him in the knee and making his face contort in pain, changing the music from a racy celebration of the drunk's progress to a, a lament for all unjustly injured musicians. Tomas got to the doorway and went out into the darker hall, still hearing laughter and music behind him. He felt his way along the wall for support, realizing now he had no hope of finding his chamber without the boy who had brought him here. I'll sleep in the whoring stable then, he said, and kept moving. He felt his way along the straight wall for what felt like an hour, passing many exquisite tapestries with bizarre motifs. One stopped him and made him stand swaying before it, trying to comprehend it. It seemed to show a noblewoman from the previous century, bathing an infant, but she was holding it by its legs, head down into the tub. Bored angels in clouds above received the infant's drowsy, winged soul, while at the bottom of the tapestry, black devils with tusks coming from the bottoms of their mouths, and even stranger devils in a great variety, received the ecstatically grinning soul of the mother, a lionish thing with human hands, felt the woman's breasts. Next to it, the largest of the devils had twelve eyes and a round, fiery mouth. It seemed to stand on owl's legs. Its black hand was between the legs of the woman's soul, two fingers in her up to the knuckle. Filth, Tomas slurred. Just then the candle to the left of the tapestry flickered and a spill of wax overflowed its sconce, spilling suggestively on the floor. More filth. He remembered that he had to find the stable and go to sleep there, so he continued on. Soon he came to an open, well-lit archway he hoped might lead outside. Instead, he entered the great hall once again by the same door he had pitched out of. Everyone was looking at him deeply amused but silent, as if they had been waiting to surprise him. He felt his way to his seat, pulled it forward, and sat down again next to the unconscious priest. He put his arm on his head and slept. An instant later, someone was shaking him. It was the man next to him, the man he had tried to strike. Sir Knight! Sir Knight! the man was saying in a hushed voice. What? Tomas slurred. The man's mouth was so close to his face he could see the texture of his green little tongue and a dark shred of meat between two of his asymmetrical teeth. You passed out. You mustn't sleep at table. Tomas shook his head and sat up, profoundly confused. He was about to point out to his neighbor that the priest was sleeping and nobody had bothered him, but when he looked again he saw the priest was awake and having his goblet filled again. Everyone is toasting the heroic deeds of the war with England. You don't want to miss it, do you? No, he said thickly. The serving woman now filled his goblet. He saw that her nipple was out over the top of her garment and had the nearly irresistible urge to lean forward and lick it. Across the hall, Deobald de Barentin had taken to his feet and was looking at Tomas with his protuberant eyes. And let us not forget our friend, Sir Tomas of Picardy, he said, although I cannot remember what town in Picardy, but I believe I met you near Combray ten years ago. Tomas felt his face flush, and he resisted the urge to look down. Yes, it was you, the other man continued, your seigneur, the Comte de Givras, a worthy man with ridiculously large mustachios, was camped near the Count of Hainault as the English drew their battle lines across from us. You are correct, Sir Knight. I was there. Let us speak of something happier. Forgive me, I must continue. It's just too good. This Tomas was not yet a knight. Though he had thirty years behind him, still his manners were so coarse and his birth so low, his seigneur, again a wise and worthy man, had not yet bestowed upon him his belt and spurs. Now imagine. This great battle was about to start, 
and suddenly a noise went up from all the men on both sides. The Count of Ainul hastily knighted some dozen of his young squires and men-at-arms so that they might fight and perhaps die in the holy state of Christian knighthood. This man's lord, looking at his brawling, over-muscled squire with white hairs coming into his beard, took pity upon him and knighted him as well. Only the battle hadn't started yet. A hair had leapt between the legs of the French army, and they had been cheering at that. A hair! The battle never started. Our king decided to remove himself, and everyone went away. Only here were all these sad bastards knighted because of a hair. The knights of the Order of the Hare, and one of their illustrious number is with us tonight. I have fought many actions since then, Tomas roared. All in our king's service, no doubt. Get yourself fucked, and your shit-nosed girl of a squire. I don't have to answer to you. Where have you fought? In a whorehouse brawl? For the right to plough your whore mother without paying? Ah, there's that rare strain of nobility that made your lord so proud to knight you. And you know perfectly well where I fought. You're just too drunk to remember. My nobility will show itself on the field, Tomas said, waving off the girl who tried to fill his cup again, and not in perfumed words to impress teenage serving girls. Theobald bowed. Ho, ho, ho! The seigneur said, now I would not miss the night tourney for anything, not counting anything. He smiled with his mouthful of black teeth. Night. The blackest hour of it. Tomas found himself in bed, but he was not sure how he got there. His head hurt miserably. A small wax candle guttered in a nook making the shadows on the stone walls hop nauseatingly. He would have done anything for a cupful of, or even a palmful of water. The figure next to him shifted. Père Mathieu, he whispered. The figure shifted again, pulling the blanket half off itself, revealing the very pale, moly back of the Lord's daughter. Something growled from the lower half of the bed. He looked up to see a tiny dog curled between his mistress's feet, growling a warning at him. He growled back at it, then reclined. The room smelled like hot cunt and red wine vomit. He checked over his side of the bed and confirmed his suspicion that he had been the source of the latter. Fragments of the night's events came to him in watery flashes, her open mouth coming to kiss his, her teeth graying toward the black of her father's teeth, her pear-green eyes half-lidded as her tongue flicked forward, her breath with its notes of garlic, fecundity, and rot. His two fingers sunk in her up to the knuckle her wheezing beneath him and digging into his shoulders with her fat little fingers, her legs curled up so she made a football of herself. She had bitten one of his nipples so badly he wondered if he might lose it. So this is hell, he muttered. He glanced at his borrowed robe, which was hanging from a nail near his head. He noticed the cloth of gold stars on the sage-green fabric and saw that they looked very much like the stars in the actual night sky. He found the constellation of the swan. Then he found his comet with its bloody little vein and the smaller one near it. He was afraid now. He did not want to touch the robe, so he put on his soiled long shirt and inner leggings. When he sat gingerly upon the bed to put his boots on, the little dog uncurled itself and stood yapping and growling at him as if it were in pain. Soon it was, because it made the mistake of biting Tomas's arm, for which he grabbed it, absorbing two more little bites, and flung it against the wall. It made a great noise. He didn't look to see if it had roused the woman on the bed, because he didn't want to see one of her large green eyes fixed on him. 
he was grateful to hear her chortle softly and then snore. He took his sword and left. Soon he was lost again in the labyrinth of stone halls, dripping candles, and sputtering torches. At last he felt cool air and went outside into the night. Other people, still dressed in finery from the feast, were moving in the dark courtyard as well, and some now came through the same door he had just used. The woman from his bed was one of these, her headpiece perched on her high forehead again, the wicked little dog in her arms, her green dress shining. How did she get dressed so quickly? She ignored him as she moved past, then turned her head and said, You'd better find your armor, and I hope you ride better than you fuck. Theobald outclasses you miserably there. <laughs> Everyone around them heard and laughed. He stood there, headachy and confused. While the crowd flowed past him, he looked where they were going and saw pennants flapping in the cool night breeze over a grounded constellation of lit lamps and torches. The tournament field. He felt a tug at his elbow and saw the boy, Simon, standing there. The armorer wants you. Run. Get out of this place. Armorer. How long had it been since he'd had an armorer? In his confusion, he followed the boy to a lit tent. The two men who had taken his armor before were within, ready to suit him in his mail and plate. It had all been scarred and shown marvelously. A tournament helm sat on the arming table. Tomas's mouth stood open. Don't just gawk at us and don't get too attached to it. Sir Theobald will smash it all into junk like as not, and you with it. He fights with a mace, and he's quick as a fish from a dead man's skull. Tomas nodded at them and let them begin. He noticed his surcoat cleaned now and emblazoned with a heraldic image that had not been there before. Two fleurs de lis and a hair. He chuckled. Yes, this was hell. And if all that was left for him to do was fight, he would fight to frighten Lucifer. Fuck it, he said. Just fuck it. That's what we say, Sir Tomas, the older man said, the older armorer. And if it won't let you fuck it, cut its throat. Hey, Jacques Mill, pass us down his sword. He'll want that clean, too. The other man handed him the sword, and the armorer only half unsheathed it before he sheathed it again and put it down on the arming table. Christ, what the hell is on this thing? I killed something foul in a river. Well, I'm not touching it. Hey, Jacques Mel, you want any of this? He asked the other one. The other one shook his head. The first one tossed the sword at Tomas's feet, and they finished buckling him in. A horse whinnied outside the tent. That'll be your horse, Grisatre. I thought he was riding Bellatre. All oh, right, the seigneur is riding Grisatre. At that, trumpet sounded, and the herald spoke, though Tomas could not hear what he was saying. Then the crowd roared. The tourney had begun. Tomas went out of the tent and saw the mottled charger he was meant to ride, a grey-haired, long-headed squire in an ill-fitting jerkin and loose hose held the reins, and the man was so drunk he could, he could barely stand. A second look at the ridiculous squire showed him to be Mathieu Anicot, the priest. <coughs> Excuse me. The sound of something punching through armor came from the tournament field, and the crowd loosed and impressed. Oh! Tomas's borrowed horse turned to look at him, and Mathieu motioned toward the saddle. Tomas mounted. Are you yourself or a devil? Tomas asked, putting on his tournament helmet. I don't know, the priest slurred, but I'm fairly sure there's a devil out there. A horrible shriek came from the field. The crowd went, ho, oh, oh, the way a crowd will when something awful has happened to a man. The squire priest grabbed a lance from where it leaned against a rail and handed it to Tomas, taking up two spares as well. Tomas looked down the shaft at the point. It was a war point, sharp and deadly, not the blunted quartet of knobs one used in tourneys. So be it, he said. 
Let's go die, priest. I wish that were all we risked here, Mathieu said. He turned the horse and brought it onto the trampled sod of the list. Oh, for Christ's sake, he said under his breath. Two horsemen were on the field, and a third waited on the far side. What must have been a hundred torches burned, and burned the image into his mind. The German-looking Frenchman from the feast was sitting dead in the saddle, a lance through his side. His helmet was off. The seigneur, also sans helmet, circled his horse around him, then spurred it close, using a one-handed war-axe to split the man's head laterally from the nose to the back of his skull, the contents of which flew all over the sand. The crowd screamed its approval. Then a monkey came from beneath the stands, a monkey of the same sort as the three who had been roasted for supper, and began to pick from the sand and eat what had flown from the man's head. When it had gotten all there was to be found on the sand, it scampered up the horse and up the armored body of the half-headed German Frenchman and began to eat directly from the bowl of his remaining head. Ooh, went the crowd. Now the monkey kicked his heels against the armor of the dead knight he straddled, and the knight's body jerked and spurred the horse, who trotted off the field to eat grass. The knight's body slid heavily out of the saddle, and the monkey scampered beneath the stands again. The crowd went silent, then began to chant, Next! 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 The lord, still circling on Grisatre, began to chant, Next! Next! Oh, excuse me. The, the lord, still circling on Grisatre, pointed his gory axe at Tomas. Tomas suppressed a shudder. I can't. I can't. I can't he thought, then spurred his horse forward to take his position at the end of the list. Lance or sword, Tomas shouted at the seigneur. Lance, he bellowed, but not me. Him. Theobald de Barentin was in position now, placing his tournament helm and taking his lance. He sat a whitish horse that couldn't wait to run. His dandy squire handed him his first lance, Ready! screamed the lord, raising his axe. Theobald raised his lance. Tomas raised his. The axe fell. The chargers started off, Tomas's more heavily, and the two made for each other. At French tournaments, a barrier normally separated the jousting knights to prevent collision, but this was open like a German field. Tomas reined his horse to keep it on the right side, his lance pointed crosswise, but the horse stubbornly made right for its oncoming counterpart. At the last minute, the other horse corrected, and the men shocked their lances into one another. Tomas felt his glance solidly but harmlessly off Theobald's chest piece, rocking him back with the impact. Theobald's point, however, gouged into Tomas just below the left hip, dislodging several links of chain and digging a hotly painful furrow into him. He gritted his teeth and tried unsuccessfully not to grunt, reeling but staying upright in the saddle. Both men had kept their lances, so they wheeled their horses around and repositioned themselves for another charge. Neither waited for a signal from the seigneur this time. They both made for each other. This time, however, Tomas felt his horse slowing beneath him. He swore at it and spurred it, but... Bellatre kept losing speed, even as the other knight loomed larger and more dangerous through the slit in Tomas's helm. The horse stopped altogether. You whore! Tomas said to his mount, even as Theobald's point dropped and slammed into Bellatre's chest. The horse screamed, reared, and threw Tomas off. He landed heavily on his back, sending a wave of pain down his legs all the way to his heels. He sat up to see the dying horse topple on its side, kicking its legs in the air. No sooner had it landed than at last a score of dark shapes rushed from beneath the stands and swarmed over it. The monkeys. Only this time, Tomas wasn't sure they were monkeys. Whatever they were, they dragged the horse away, already disemboweling it. 
Forgive me, Sir Tomas, the seigneur said. I didn't know my horse was a fucking coward. Tomas crabbed his way to his feet. Why wasn't his squire helping him up? He removed his borrowed helmet and looked back down the list. He saw Mathieu now lolling against a rail, his head tipped back. The viol player from before was pouring wine down his throat, his free hand rubbing the older man's crotch. The lord barked, On foot! And now Tomas turned and saw the other knight stomping toward him, swinging a flanged mace, his helmet also off. Right, Tomas said, and drew his sword. He moved first against Theobald, running at him and lunging his point at the other man's face. The knight spun and sidestepped at the same time, bringing his mace around into Tomas's back, breaking a rib. Tomas let the momentum take him forward so he wouldn't be in jeopardy from a second blow. The armorer, the armorer was right. Theobald was fast, as a fish from a dead man's skull. He heard the armor moving behind him and sensed the mace passing only half a hand's length from where his head had just been. But Tomas had tricks, too. He planted his foot and spun suddenly, crouching at the same time, driving his point at the other man's middle. It struck home, and even though the male stopped it, the force pushed the man back and sapped the strength from his mace swing so that when it landed on Tomas's shoulder piece, it hurt, but didn't damage. His back was in agony. Did water just come from Theobald's armor? Tomas didn't have time to pull back for a proper swing, so he chopped short across his body, hacking at Theobald's inner arm to try to knock the mace out of it. He knocked the mace arm wide, but his foe kept his weapon, letting the momentum carry it over his own head and backhanded into Tomas's arm, which went numb. Salt water got into his eyes. Theobald was definitely leaking salt water, and his armor was now finely coated with rust. Tomas didn't actively notice these things. Without hesitation, he switched hands and licked out with a sword point, which caught the other man between the knuckles of his mace hand, opening the links of his chain mitten and making him drop the mace. Now Tomas saw the exposed hand and how white it was, so white it was almost translucent. A fucking hand! He lashed out with a blade again and caught Theobald across the side of the head. Seawater, not blood, gushed from the wound. It stank. Theobald looked amused. He opened his mouth and a scream came out, but it was not his scream. It was the scream of the fat peasant who had died in the river. It was the scream the thing in the river had mimicked. Tomas recovered from his stupefaction and swung hard now with his working arm. Theobald, who was getting puffier and whiter by the second, raised his arm so it caught the force that had been meant for his neck. The armor saved the arm from getting severed, but the bones in it were broken and he careened sideways. More water gushed from him. An eel slithered out of his leg armor to writhe on the sand. The sky was not as dark as it had been. Theobald scrambled for his mace now, picking it up with the badly broken arm. Tomas struck him across the back, breaking his scapula. Unconcerned, Theobald lurched up, and the mace head backhanded Tomas across his own numb arm, which was also broken. The opponents paused now and looked at each other. Theobald grinned at Tomas, and thread-fine marine worms sprouted from his lips. A small fish ate one of his eyes from the inside, and he stank, and he stank. Theobald de Barentin, Theobald, dead at the Battle of Stuise. He fell into the sea when an English ship rammed into the ship he was on. He was the best fighter in Normandy, but he was not stabbed or shot with arrows. He just slipped on the wet deck and fell into the water where his armor pulled him under. 
Tomas's lord had told his men before they met the English at Crecy to remind them that no death was inglorious when suffered in the field. Light was coming into the sky. Hurry! screamed a woman from the stands, and the cry was picked up by the other spectators, all of whom were beginning to rot now. Some yelled, Kill him! or The son! The lord of the castle shouted, Hurry! as well, and tried to shout it again, but the word changed into the roar of a lion. Tomas spared a glance at him, and saw that he was growing taller, stretching out of his armor, so that his skin showed between sections. His head was a lion's head now, but lumpy and corrupt, balanced badly on the ungainly stack of flesh and armor he had become. A devil, a devil from hell and a court of the damned. The thing that had been the seigneur started taking jerky steps toward them. Theobald lashed madly with his mace now, and Tomas blocked or avoided all but one blow, which he stepped into at the last instant to avoid taking the head of the mace. Instead, he caught the shaft across his jaw, which broke. Hurry! screamed the mob, which had begun running off the stands toward the combatants. Tomas shoved his sword into the face of what used to be Theobald de Berentin, and it shuddered, and it stopped moving. Tomas yanked the sword out of it, but fell on his side. The lion devil roared, standing over Tomas. The crowd of finely dressed corpses moved closer. One of the monkey things tugged the armor off his foot and bit it. Tomas held his sword up. The sun's crown came over the edge of the land, just one brilliant orange diamond's worth. And it was all gone. Everything. Tomas was lying in a cow field, holding up his sword, dressed in his rusty armor. Neither his arm, nor his rib, nor his jaw were broken. A rusted plow stood where the lion devil had been, one of its spars hanging at the angle of the axe it had just been holding. A dead sheep lay in exactly the position the corpse of Sir Theobald had assumed when he collapsed. A small Norman tower, long abandoned and crumbling, stood where the mighty, huge castle had been when they first saw it at dusk. The priest, lying face down in his robes, was breathing heavily in his sleep. A whoring dream, Tomas said. He got to his feet and stretched. He saw a mound of dirt and walked over to it, having a long piss against it. He realized he had to shit as well, and walked around the dirt mound to see if he could find an ass-wiping plant. What he found instead was a common grave. The last corpses were recent and had not been shoveled under very well. A woman's moly, nude back stood out at him, also the herald. The small boy, Simon, in bright livery, and the Moorish musician. A little dead dog had been tossed in as well. The sunrise was among the most beautiful he had ever seen. He got to his knees, meaning to thank God for it, but couldn't think of any words to say. The girl walked over to him, brushing a leaf out of her hair. Are you ready to go to Paris now? she said. Yes.